Okay, let's start. So welcome everyone. So yeah, I'm going to yeah to talk about how at Moody's are we creating uh, the data story format. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated at Hayotwa in Edinburgh, so not too far from the data lab. Um, then I moved to to London, where I was a data visualization specialist for uh, a newspaper, the New Statesman. While I was doing data visualization for them working with data journalists. And then uh, I came back to Edinburgh and I'm also uh, working with Moody's, uh, creating, well, the asset I'm going to talk about. Um, yeah, uh, we're a, a team of four. Um, the team is quite new, uh, only two, two, year, two years, two years old. Um, four members, uh, we're all data visualization specialists. We've been publishing uh, well, well, for two years now. Um, everything's going great. We're doing cool stuff. Um, and yeah, we're doing data stories. So what is a data story? Uh, well, the concept is to tell a story, so a narrative through using different medium. Um, so it could be videos, could be images, um, and data visualization. Um, it's very powerful. It's really a powerful asset. Uh, using data to support your story is making it real, kind of, and being able to interact with the different assets is um, well, helping your reader grasping uh, what you're trying to say, so there's a message behind it. Uh, you can play with design uh, to make people remember uh, of your story. Uh, you can play with... Um, the format when you're doing a data visualization, are you explaining something? Are you making the reader explore the different possibilities? Um, yeah, a, a really great asset. Let's go through one. So this one is the first data story we published at Moody's. Uh, I just wanted to just to share uh, what it looks like to the ones that might not be um, comfortable with the format. So yeah, you have a web page article. This one is about neobanks. Uh, some part of the story would be uh, explainers. So the first section here, for example, is a scrolly section. So you, you scroll through the section, uh, you have something animating in the background, step-by-step step, explaining a concept. Um, and yeah, as you scroll through, you get the insight, the explanation. Uh, sometimes it's interactive, you can explore, uh, having a bit more insights. Um, yep, then he's keeping scrolling. Then we go off to the next section, which is uh, a bit less taking you by the hand, uh, but you can still explore the interactive. Um, so this one is showing JP Morgan total number of customers compared to fintechs, how many customers each fintechs have. And we can see here, for example, that WeBank has way more customers than JP Morgan. Okay, then we can grow through. Uh, nothing wrong with static charts. Um, it just depends on the context. Next slide. So, one of the big questions we could ask is why is Moody's doing data stories? Um, usually, I mean, you came across, if you came across data stories, must have been uh, in the news for the New York Times, for example. So great uh, doing this kind of content, or you could say that for news agencies, quite useful to get the people engaged. Moody's is a financial rating agency part of is most of the business, but it's also an analytics company. So they're creating reports that they are selling to clients. It's part of the business, not all of it. But yeah, creating reports, selling to clients. They have a lot of data. They have a, a lot of great people uh, doing uh, an amazing work at analyzing the data, compiling it into these reports and selling them. Um, but it's quite if you're not an expert and if you're looking at the reports, you might uh, miss a lot of information. So the, the format is tailored to from experts to 
banks, expert companies that are the client for these reports. And this is where we come. So we're creating the data stories. We have a different audience. Um, we have three main personas that we're trying to, to target. First, we have the broader audience. Uh, the data story format is a really open one. We're trying to inform, but also educate on, on the specific topics. Um, let people enjoy uh, having people reading it, learning something and sharing it online uh, is great for us. It's making Moody's names, uh, elevating the brand through sharing and having people talking about it. Um, we're also targeting reporters. Uh, when we publish, we want the data story to be uh, about something unique. We, we want to make the news. So we have data. Uh, what can we make out of it that would make people talk about uh, Moody's data and Moody's analysis? So reporters and also experts. Um, we love to see when experts are taking what we're doing and sharing it with Client, for example, saying, well, uh, this is what I'm doing or working on right now. Moody's has done a great job uh, explaining it in a refined way and more accessible way. Uh, so have a look and play with it. Um, yeah, so great format. And now let, let's let's dig in. Let's, how, how, how do we do that? Where do we start? So everything starts with uh, an ID. Um, so ID can come from somewhere in the company. Doesn't need to be from someone in the data story team. It can be from someone in the financial part of the company, someone from the analytics side of the company. Uh, someone has an ID. Um, then joining us, sending us an email or reaching to us. And we create a group, a working group. So who who's in that group? So first, yeah, as I mentioned, we're only four in the team so far. So maybe two people from our team could be more, obviously. Uh, so two people from the database team. Um, so obviously we are data visualization expert. We have uh, different backgrounds in the team. Some can do stop motions, also can do videos, editing, um, and then web coding, this kind of stuff. And we have uh, a sense of design and storytelling. Then we have uh, analysts and research writers. Um, they're expert of the topic. So maybe they had the ID or we came with an ID. Uh, they know what's available. What data does Moody's have? Um, what we can do with it? Um, if we need data from elsewhere, they know where to find it. And they also know what reports have been published in the past. So that if uh, we need to look back at something that already exists, they know where to find it or who to ask for the information. Then we have a campaign coordinator um, watching at what we're doing, watching at the pitch and trying to align the future publication date, possible public publication date to a company event. Again, we're trying to share what we're doing to a broad audience, but maybe we can get some initial audience from a company event. So if there is an event on, uh, I don't know, uh, fintechs, maybe we can publish the fintech project at the same time. It makes sense. And finally, uh, depending on the project, uh, we might have just other actors. Um, I think the the most common one is where the analysts are playing with data, but they're using a tool, uh, in-house tool. Uh, we want to have more granularity, so we need to go to the people in charge of the database and ask them, okay, we need this kind of data. Can you please provide it to us? Um, yeah, this kind of actors. Or, Maybe sometimes we, we also had someone outside of Moody's, but an expert on the topic to talk a bit about what we were working on. So, okay, so we have an idea. 
um, we have a group of people willing to work on this idea. What do we do next? Uh, well, we need to transform the initial idea into a message. So we have an idea we do. We want, okay, fintechs are growing. Great. Um, how do we start from this idea and create a world of possibilities, data? How can we talk about this? Uh, well, the first things we're looking for is uh, would the message that we create from this ID uh, make the news? So as I mentioned, would this, me would this message be something new that we haven't seen? If it's something that has already been published by someone else, uh, maybe it's a pass. Um, can we make the message conversational? Uh, it's something we want to share to everyone. So if we can create a message that people can talk about uh, in, I know, at the pub or to the family because they found it really interesting, then, yeah, definitely we, we should have a look at that. Um, do we have enough data to support that message? Um, often we have an ID, and as we develop it into a message, uh, we need to have more data that's initially planned. Um, so maybe you want to look at something different or something that would support the initial ID, but we don't have the data yet. So do we have enough uh, and who to ask? And finally, in what format, where is the data? All these questions um, we need to answer just to be sure that we have enough uh, content to make the data story. Um, also, obviously, we also need time. Uh, we are a small team. Uh, we have lots of projects to work on, uh, often at the same time. Each project takes us, uh, let's say, about a month. So we do need to, to plan ahead. And about planning, maybe we have other projects we need to prioritize. Um, maybe there is a hurricane campaign in the US. So we do want to publish something about uh, climate change at the same time. So we need to align it. And if projects are coming in, then we need to ask, um, can you wait? Is there a campaign in a few months that we can align on? If Because we don't have availabilities to do it now. Um, yeah. OK, next slide. OK, so we have a message. Uh, we have the data, we have the time. Uh, great, well, let's let's start. Uh, where do we start? <laughs> okay, we have a message, great. Now we need to shape it into a narrative. Um, so we know we want to talk about FinTech. We have lots of data around it. How do we organize the data so that it makes sense? Well, we're going to look at examples just later on. Um, we have data, we need to explore it. So the analyst gave us data, but as a data visualization specialist, let's explore it. Do we have outliers? Do we have what we need? Uh, is there something interesting that we haven't thought at the beginning that is now starting to be interesting? Um, sometimes data is not just numbers, it's like policies, for example, uh, it's text, so how do we play with that? Uh, what do we do with it? Uh, we're starting to sketch, design, ideas. Uh, this is the really beginning of the project. We want to, to look, again, as part of the exploring the available data. And finally, the most important point, as we're starting the project, we are student of the topic. Um, I've worked on many projects where well, I don't know any. I'm not a specialist. I, I don't know much about uh, the China property market, but the, the analysts, they, they do. So asking questions, 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 asking for literature, trying to understand um, the context of the data. What am I doing? Uh, is, is really helping. So the goal here is if you, you will never be an expert, but you need to understand the data enough so that you can explain it to someone else. And because in the data story we, we do, we want to 
explain that, explain new things to people, then we need to understand it to be able to explain it. Great. So now let's have a look at our sketches that we've made. Uh, so that's the first one. Okay, let me annotate. Can I annotate? Yes. Okay, great. Chook. Yeah, you should be able to see it. So uh, on the on the left, there's a drawing I've done in the very beginning of the fintech project we've seen before. Uh, so this was about the number of customer chart. Uh, and initially, I was thinking of having, okay, we have traditional banks on the left with a drop down, fintech banks on the right with a drop down as well. Uh, and Googling, selecting banks and comparing the number of customers with bubbles and we have packed. Then I decided, so I had two options. Maybe the bubbles are coming from the outside of the page, maybe from the inside. Uh, then I decided that maybe we shouldn't be able to select uh, traditional banks because let's just pick the biggest big one, the biggest one, which is JP Morgan and compare everything to JP Morgan. And as you can see in the final result, uh, we decided, well, maybe we can just overlap both and it would make more sense and be more elegant this way. Okay, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, this is one of the design can wireframes that we do at very early stage. So you're starting exploring the data. Next question is, how do we create the narrative, build the narrative and have an overview of what we'll be doing? We haven't started coding the page web page yet, but we need to know how we want to organize things so we can communicate communi communicate it with them, with everyone. So this is uh, administration of that. You can see on the left, uh, we have the main ideas and then trying to attach a, a section to it. And the next step of the same project. Choo -choo -choo. Oh, can I change? Yes. Up. Oh, be this one is the same same wireframe. I mean, about the same project. You can see there is an iteration, design choices. The data might not be real yet on the wireframe, but we kind of decided where we wanted to go. And this is again another iteration of the same project. And here we're starting to see real data. Um, up. Okay, we have wireframes, we have data, we have a story. Uh, I forgot to mention on the other side, as we're building the wireframes, the analysts and research writers are working with us in another document, a uh, world document shared with everyone uh, to build the narrative. So they would write what we need to write, the article layer, and we would come in the document and try to rearrange section, move them around, or highlight sections where maybe the language isn't accessible enough. And this is where we can help them uh, shaping the text. Okay, so we have the analysts working on the, on the text on one side, we have the data visualization team working on the design and trying to find, okay, can we do something cool, but also can we do something that obviously is insightful and conveys a message? And we iterate, we iterate a lot, a lot, and a lot, uh, and a lot. And now I want to present you one of the iteration process we've done, which I find quite interesting. Uh, it and it was about um, a chart in our China property project. China, yep. So let, let's go across. So it's all starting here. I got some data. Um, there's two, two data sets here that I'm going to play with. So the first one is talking about policies. Um, so from the government or different kind of authorities, and it's about uh, do we tighten the market or do we loosen the market, depending on what's happening, to try to st stabilize it? Um, so lots of policies. We have starting dates 
an ending date sometimes, not every time. And on the user side, here on the user data set, uh, we have um, date and then state of the market. Uh, the change, is it going up? Is it going down? Uh, I'm not going into the three months moving average sales volume details, but yeah, describing volume of sales. Okay, so we have this data. First things I've done is trying to, to show it and see if I can get trends out of it. So that's the first chart I've done. So it's comparing the property developer total loan. So how much money they're loaning against national sales. Uh, I, I spotted different things here. Uh, first one, there's no, I mean, there's a trend, but it's not very interesting to compare both of them. Uh, also on the national sales one on the right. Um, I wasn't seeing much variation on a linear axis. I was like, well, okay, we, we would need a super big axis to, to see variation in time. So maybe there's another solution that we could go through. So I was looking for inspiration. So this were my two biggest inspiration for this one. So on the left, we, we're seeing um, charts from Nadia Bremer. Um, this two things I liked about it. So first it was a radio layout. Um, I wanted to do radio layout. I was like, well, it makes sense culturally as I learned at some point that in China time was perceived as cyclical. So I was like, if we can do something cyclical, it would fit the theme. Uh, and at the same time, I like the color bands that she's using. So even if it's a radio layout, the color band convey an idea of the value that you can read. So you don't need an extra axis for that. But also my issue is it is that I couldn't find a cycle in the data. Um, the data maybe wasn't big enough or this just isn't the cycle. So how I don't want to circle and convey the idea that after the end of all data, then to just jump back and start all over again, because that isn't true. So I was like, maybe we can find another shape that just keeps continuing and that's a spiral. So I looked for spirals charts. I found the one by Eric Lowe. I was like, okay, so people do spirals. Uh, I don't know if it will fit my data, but at least let's try to have it on screen and see what I can do with it. Okay, so this is where I, I do the eyes of the tiger montage. Um, okay, just so doing my math again, learning what is a spiral, uh, how does it work mathematically so I can have it on screen. Um, hours of coding, days of invested in in learning how can I do this shape? Uh, is it the right one? Hopefully, uh, but I, I really do need to try. At this point, it was kind of a challenge. So let's say after a week of really trying to get the spiral working, finally, this is what I got. Okay, well, um, not very convincing, but after a few more iterations, this is okay, this is better. Uh, so different feedback from the first iteration. First, great, I got it working on screen. Um, checking with the data, it wasn't really, I mean, I could see that some data point weren't uh, correct. So I was like, okay, there's something with the data that I need to fix. But I was still quite happy because I got it on screen and I was happy about my math. It's like next iteration, okay, uh, short title, um, I added red and green dots uh, to talk about the policies as a good or bad policies. Yes, no, but it doesn't make sense as a loosening or tightening, but it shouldn't be green and red because it's not good or bad. It's just tightening or loosening policies. Um, the next iteration. So red and green, sorry, red and green. We forgot about these colors. It's about tightening and loosening. So I changed the color of the policies. So dots, just yes. 
um, I amplified um, variation on the chart so we can really see the trends. And I added annotation as well to give some context about what's happening. Uh, you can see that I also put in the middle of the section uh, what we're talking about, but it's still not, I mean, it's missing a key. So next step, I actually added a key, change the title in the middle to have something a bit more digestible. Uh, we have the key on the side, the title move from the top to the side again to try to gain some space. And at this point, I'm quite happy with what I have. Uh, okay, I wanted to try doing a spiral. I want in these coral bands. I want in the tightening policies, easing policies. Okay, everything is on screen. Great. Now let's let's uh, fetch feedback. And the analysts were like, well, George, we, we really like what you've been doing and the time we you spent on it, but it's not really um, working for us. Uh, it's complex. It's difficult to read the information. Um, there's a lot of things happening at the same time. You have annotation time. It's, everything's moving. It's not working for us. So sad time, um, but if it's not working for the reader, then I, I need to step back. So the first is, okay, at this point, we also change the design of the page itself. So instead of redoing, like changing the colors and everything, we I was like, well, I need to, to change my ID. So how do I simplify that? Well, first step, let's take a step back, forget about the spiral and do this, uh, radio layout without taking care of uh, it being cycle or not. Also, let's remove the color bands and see how it looks like. Okay, great. So from these two steps, it's really, yeah, killing the spiral, making it a, cycle, a circle and removing the color bands. And it's already way easier to read something, something, but there's again a lot of different trends. I'm not an expert. I don't know what to see in this chart. So we decided that we wanted to have a scrolly layout on this section. So as a reader scroll, it would highlight different sections across the circle uh, with text next to it so that the reader has his scrolls get bits of information on how to read that. So this is how it initially looked like. So this would be the initial state. You scroll down, get, you scroll down, you get a bit of the chart of the data feeding in. So we're talking about 2010 to 2014. So this is the slice we get. And if you scroll down again, so this is, 2014 to 2016, then you get an extra bit of information. Um, my issue with this way of doing is that as you highlight a new time period, you still have the previous one, so 10 to 14. So as a reader, it's you, well, we're focusing, we're talking about only 2014 to 2016, but I'm displaying way more data. So uh, next iteration was about trying to make the reader focus on exactly what we're talking about. Oops, uh, ta -ta. okay, this one. So on this iteration, same, this is first step, but this time we added a window. So the yellow window on the chart, and this time every step you follow, we have the window on exactly what we're talking about giving lots more context and making it easier to read. You can also note that we added the circles, policy circles back, but we aren't differentiating the tightening and loosening policies. Uh, we also added in the middle a little something here to help the people know how much steps are left when you scroll down. 
Okay. Then here at this step, we added a differentiation between tightening and loosening. So we just, instead of using colors, we used shape. So if, is it a full circle or circle with a square hole? And we like this idea because uh, it was reminding me of old Chinese coins with a square in the middle. So again, nice design choice. Up. And finally, I'm going to skip this one. Um, we got requests um, by the end of the project about translating the full project in Mandarin. So that's what we've done. So now there's a button. If you want the, Mandarin, the version in Mandarin, we have a button. So that counts. It's an iteration as well. So this is the type of process we would go through for every chart. Uh, the more complex they are, the more iteration steps we might have. Um, and at some point we're like, okay, we're done. The narrative is great. The charts are great. We're happy about what we have right now. What do we last check? So first we need to share internally the project to a broader public, but still internally. So that project will be tested. We'll get feedback about is the project working? Um, is everything quite clear for non-expert? Um, we also do a broader fact check. So we were working with analysts and research writers, but maybe they have an unknown bias about the data they're working on. So sharing it with all the analyst teams, but that still relates to the topic is a good way of checking that we're not saying anything wrong. Accessibility checks, uh, check uh, uh, the last month's accessibility talk by Chen. But yeah, checking colors, checking language, checking contrast, making sure there's no uh, illusion because of fluid patterns. Uh, we double check it there. We have to make sure that it's friendly on all devices as most of our users are, are on mobile. Uh, performance checks, we need to check that the page is loading, is not taking half an hour to load. Uh, it sometimes happened that it's taking too much time to load. We don't want people to click on the link, wait an hour and then have the project. So this is where we try to optimize it. And finally, maybe we do a press release depending on the, on the topic. So press release um, or integration in an event that's not the data of this team to do that. It's more on the communication campaign coordinator, but this is where we stamp it. Like this is, okay, this is what we've done. Definitely we have it ready for this day. And once we have everything ready, finally uh, we publish and then we everyone's happy. <laughs> Great. Well, is it really finished? Well, we still do some uh, monitoring on the project. So measuring the success of what we just published. So different ways of doing that. Um, we're looking for, as I mentioned, different uh, input from different personas, public. So looking at how are we cited in the newspaper. Um, so it happened, so we're checking. So here we can see citation from Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, Financial Time, Reuters. Uh, so great, we've been cited by Apple News recently as well. That's our latest big win. Um, so that does uh, say a lot about the credibility we're having with this project and how popular they can get. Uh, we also were well, looking at uh, traffic to the page from where is the traffic coming from, um, which country, uh, Obviously, for example, the China property market piece, we got lots of traffic from China, unsurprisingly. Um, so maybe there's some, other, we, maybe we can do something with that. And uh, and experts sometimes are sending us emails saying, well, you did a great job at uh, explaining this specific topic. So again, uh, measuring success. And finally, while well, we're celebrating, I'm not good. We, I mean, we'll not go too much on this section, but it's uh, involving 
quite a lot of, of pizzas uh, with the team. Great. And, and on that, thank you for attending the, the presentation. And I think we can now jump into questions. Thank you, George. That was that was really interesting. Um, interesting to see the the kind of crossover between design and data. Yeah. Um, and we've got a lot of questions that have come in, uh, so I will just get straight to them, if that's all right with you. The first one is from someone anonymously. They're asking, uh, with time and resource, it can be hard to react. It can be hard to be reactive to hot topics or discussions. How do you manage and prioritize this? Or would you always recommend a substantial lead time to allow you enough time for planning and I guess iteration as well? Yeah, so we're doing something. If, we, if we're doing a data story, it will take time. So we can't really react to instant news. Sometimes we can kind of predict. So I was talking about the hurricane season. So there will be hurricanes. Uh, we're not hoping for uh, disasters, but we know that it will happen. But hot, really hot topic, maybe one of the solution we have is to do just shorter, uh, not a data story, just one interactive something that will be hosted somewhere. But yes, we, we can't do a full on data story on uh, news that just popped in. Cool. Uh, and this this question has come up in various forms from a few people, but the kind of question is, what what software and programming languages do you use to create your visualizations? Ah, I was waiting this question. Um, so we're using short answer, uh, Svelte and D three. Uh, and then yeah, web, JavaScript, HTML, CSS. Uh, that's for the final product. Before that, uh, we're using uh, Adobe Illustrator for the design. Uh, I will include pen and paper. It's not a technology, but it's part of the process. So I think that's uh, the main ones. And uh, a sharing Word doc, so online Google form, yeah, whatever. For, for the for the collaboration. Yeah. And then a similar or a related question, I suppose. Neha is asking if you could re recommend any good tools for creating visualizations if you're on a budget if you've not got a huge amount of money to play with? Well, it depends how much time you want to spend on learning. Uh, Svert and D3, uh, it's free, but it's a lot of time invested into learning how to do it. Um, if you're looking for a collab collaboration tool uh, to work on graphics with, another, with your team or something, I would have a look at Observable. Um, it's you still need to know how to code, but it's made in a way that even if you don't know how to, you have lots of tutorials and it's kind of easy to do. Um, otherwise, try, yeah, Python libraries. I'm sure there's lots of tools around that. But yeah, that's my suggestion. Cool. So. Uh, and Dan is asking, um, you, shown, you showed your, your kind of wireframe process. Mm -hmm. and Dan's asking, are these initially designed um, for cell phones? Is that the kind of first go-to? For cell, sorry? All right, so are the wireframes uh, or designs planned for cell phones first? Dan's ah, cell phones. Oh, okay, I get it. Um, well, that's something we, we want to do more and more. Um, so text, text is text. It will be size. Uh, charts, uh, there's a balance to find. Because if you want to do something big, which we like to do, uh, it will not work for mobile. So every time we want to do something really big, so the spiral, for example, wouldn't work on mobile. So we would we know that we need to find another solution, like maybe another type of chart, uh, something completely different because resizing will not work there. So it's just doubling the work, but yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> not a question, but Tatiana is commenting saying that this has been fascinating. Uh, and Anne Sophie, Anne Sophie Pereira is asking if I've got this right, you have to collaborate internally on each project with a set of researchers, analysts, and other stakeholders. Does that mean that you work with different stakeholders on each project, or is it always the same team? Uh, salut, Anne Sophie. Uh, so, yes, every project, a uh, different team every time. 
Um, so now, for example, so every time I've done a project, I've worked with different people. Uh, but now I'm working on a project which the topic is related to one that I already published. So some faces are the same. Uh, and obviously we tend to, I mean, the people with, lots of people have ideas and some people find better ideas in an easier way. So we would see the faces more, more often than others. But yes, a different team every time. It was, I was actually going to ask you a question was if you're an experience that you have um, found that any particular teams come up with better ideas to begin with. Have you ever noticed any? Any trend? Yeah. Well, at the beginning, when we started doing it, it was kind of um, difficult to explain what we were doing because we were interacting with people that, as I mentioned, were doing reports. Um, and nothing wrong with that, but it's data story is a different format. So explaining what we do and how we do it um, was kind of tricky because they would say, well, it's obvious and we would have to answer why it's not that obvious and we have to make it interesting for everyone. So, so at the beginning, yeah, we had some requests, shy requests about ideas and some of them was, were too niche. But as we published, uh, the ideas are getting better and better because people know what they are expecting from us. So it's, it's yeah, for the best now. Great. And <clears throat> Beata is saying, salute George. How are you measuring how and if your three personas are engaging with your visualizations? The usual metrics would be website SEO, references, quotes of the page, and new clients. Is there anything else that you would use for measuring? Salut Beata, ça fait longtemps. <laughs> Um, well, so far, so we have teams, so we're not doing it by ourselves, like the monitoring on the press release, for example, or on the publications, because um, we have teams for that specialized at Moody's to um, look at uh, where we mentioned. So we are relying on them. Um, we just compile how many times we've been, so I'm talking about the, the reporting side. So just compiling where we've been mentioned. Every mention is a good men mention. Um, on the broader audience uh, type of metric, it's mostly, yeah, how many, how many people came to our pages, how much time they spent, how does that compare to the other type of medium that Moody's is producing. So are data story doing better than infographics, for example, as we have an infographic department. So here it's comparison. And just for analysis, for now we're letting it to the specific teams. So I don't know all the details about that, unfortunately. And do you work with the marketing teams to, to kind of keep track of these things or do you keep it yeah. within your own team? So, so my team is part of the communication department. So we're quite close to, yes, marketing. Cool, thank you. <clears throat> so another one from Beata actually, which is what kind of platform does Moody's use for ETL? ETL, uh, if I'm not mistaken, ETL is like a way of handling, transforming the data, loading, transform, and I can't remember the other one. I could be wrong. Uh, if it's that, uh, well, I, I'm not sure. I don't know. As I'm not the one hosting and transforming the data. Um, so another question is, uh, thank you, George. You mentioned a data viz team and a data analyst team. What yes. are the main differences between these two teams and what, what are the differences in what they do? Great. So um, analyst teams, that we are working with, they are specializing in finding the data, uh, compiling it, analyzing it, process it, and transforming it into uh, bits of information that they can put in reports. Uh, and then so the analyst team will work with a researcher, research writer and create these reports. So they're not really specializing in showing visually the insights. So they would 
mostly write it and in a certain form that is really targeted to experts. Um, and the database team is more focused. We, we're focusing less on the analysis of the data we are using as it's already handled by the analysts. And we are trying to find a way to show the insights in the best way for a broad audience. And it's both um, technically in the charts, what's the best form shape for, for us to show it. And also in the design uh, to make it a pleasant journey and learn something from it. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. And we've got two questions here, which are quite similar um, from Quinton and from, well, I don't think this is a real name, Eel21303. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> they're asking uh, both pretty much the same question. How long does it normally take you for a, for a, data, visual, uh, for a data visualization project from start to finish? And uh, maybe the one that you used as an example today, how long did that take you? Um, and how would you, how are these projects typically managed? Is it agile? Someone's asking. Um, so, um, one project takes again, depending on the scale of it, I would say we have to count for a month, a month and a half, uh, cause we have to coordinate ourselves with other actors. So for example, we're starting a project, but we need data from someone else. Then we need to reach this person, wait for an answer, get the data, it would take time. So yeah, one month, one month and a half for one of the biggest projects we've done. Uh, and then uh, we're not using the HR methodology. It's really about uh, iterating, making everything, um, everyone working, I don't know how to say it, but a community project kind of, we are a group, we send emails when we have a question and and we just iterate without having specific checks or a specific person responsible to check specific things. Cool, thank you. Um, and related to last month's uh, session with Jen, someone's asking, uh, this is anonymous, are these types of visualizations accessible for, for example, for a screen reader? And are there different types of visualizations that are best suited for web accessibility um, if these are under businesses' website policies? That's a great question. Um, that's something we're working on. Um, there will be, so right now it's not uh, super accessible to screen readers, but we're trying our best to make it possible. Uh, so that's on progress. Um, uh, so the chart, everything else than the chart should be all right. But we need to to add some uh, things to read when the screen reader arrives at the charts because it's well, it's custom. It's not a simple shape, so we need to add description to that. So in progress, but we we hope that it will come. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Dan is asking: <clears throat> To what extent is there a risk of trading off aesthetic beauty for accuracy? For example, as a statistician. I would already be concerned of trends that were mined from the data, which could be false positives uh, or carefully filtered noise. Uh, add to that all the cleaning and beautifying, and I wonder how much veridicity remains. Great. So we, we keep everything. Um, we're not hiding anything. We are not cherry picking anything. Um, and the data we're displaying has been verified and fact checked by analysts and it's like we're trying to make it how can i say that we're trying to make it real in a way that what we're showing is a more honest as possible view uh, so that you can trust what you're reading um so for all of the statistical analysis is on the analyst teams to to find the best way of showing trustful information it's on them and on the design part it's on us to make the right decisions so that what we're showing is real we're not having any bias in the way we're showing it so that comes from us uh, applying um, the right design methods and data visualization good practices so that what we're showing is, is trustful 
Thank you. Um, and the next question is, <clears throat> what happens when your analysis brings forward interesting elements that the editorial team has not foreseen or does not want to include? Can the narration get in the way of, I guess it's similar to the last question, can the narration get in the way of um, the depiction of the data? Is there ever any kind of friction between what the... But that's that's make it interesting. Um, it's not. It's often not an issue, but more like a, a question, something we need to address. So we have a narrative. We don't often have, so we don't often have like, okay, we have data and then the narrative doesn't fit it because that's what we're discussing at the really beginning of the project. And the analysts, they know what the data is about and what it's going to show. But sometimes we have outliers. Sometimes we have trends that we weren't expecting. So it's not about something confronting the narrative, but just something new. So say, hey, we have this new trend that we spotted in the data. Can you explain us what it is? And maybe it's interesting enough so we can include it in the story. And in that case, it's just a discussion about, um, usually we have two solutions. Either we make a section about it saying, well, uh, this is interesting in this and that's why it's interesting. Or we add the notes. So it's not part of the story as it, but if you spot the outlier, then usually you have a note explaining what it is so that you get this extra bit of insights um, and, and you, you can take it with you. Cool. Um, and so I guess in the data lab community, we have a lot of members who are currently students or are maybe at the early stages in their career. Um, and one of the questions that's coming from Laura is around kind of your, your journey and kind of how did you get into this line of work? Um, yeah. If you could touch on that a little bit. So, um, so I graduated at Hyatt Watt, Edinburgh, and I've done a master's degree in artificial intelligence. Um, but I had the data visualization course uh, and I loved it. I found Nadia's primary portfolio at the time and I was like, that's amazing. I want to do that now. And that's why I picked this specific sector. Um, thanks to the data lab, uh, I found an internship to write my master thesis at the end of the year. So I joined Snapdragon LTD, which is based in Edinburgh. Um, hi to them. Uh, so I've done a dashboard for them. Um, it, it was great first experience. Then, uh, for some times, I went back to France and I had a job where I was doing kind of a data analyst job using Tableau and stuff. And I was like, I don't want to do that because it's too restrictive and I need to learn a tool, but the, the day Tableau's gone, then I would need to relearn everything all over again. So instead I decided to invest even more time into learning D3 JavaScript and coding. Um, I found a job in London, as I mentioned. So I was a junior uh, data journalist slash uh, code data visualization expert. And uh, I had a great mentor at the time, hi Josh. Uh, so he could, he, he teached me how to create the assets technically. So I spent two years with them, uh, learning all the strings on how to do that. And, uh, well, I moved to Moody's two years ago, um, uh, where I'm the one thankful to my experience with the new statesman in London. Uh, I was the first. So we were only two when we started, my manager and me, and I had uh, enough knowledge to build uh, the full pipeline and code base that we're using right now. Great, thank you. And, and that's it, yeah. So I think we've got time for one more question. And interestingly, you said you studied artificial intelligence because James McKinnon is asking, is there ever likely to be a trend or a time where AI can be taught to do much of the work that, you know, the initial work that you do for the wireframe um, with only a single analyst and editor approving what the AI generates? Interesting question. Um, I don't believe so, at least not right now. Um, 
So you can use AI, for example, to, to generate your text and then you fact proof it, but it would be really difficult to do that for design. Um, design is something else. There's a bit of more, I mean, it's difficult to talk about that with the AI, but I don't think so right now. Um, I think there's a lot of humanity in what we're writing in a way that we we are going through the learning process. Me, I'm learning every time. And this is because I'm learning that I know the, I know, well, it's relative, but I think I can give the information in the best way to people that are willing to learn. Uh, that might change, but I think not yet. Brilliant, thank you. So we are almost out of time. So I just wanted to say thank you again for, for taking the time to speak to us today. And um, there are still a lot of questions that we haven't been able to get to, uh, nearly 20 questions that haven't been answered yet. So if people want to keep in touch with you, um, <clears throat> my recommendation would be to join the community and, and keep in touch in there. But are, are, is there anywhere else people could find you if they want to get in touch? Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, that's where I'm, I'm, I'm in Twitter X, whatever, what's the name <laughs> of it? Good, but yeah, uh, feel free to send me a message on, on LinkedIn. I'm more active there. And if not, Twitter. And if you're in Edinburgh, happy to, to get a coffee and just have a chat. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.